Hello and welcome. I'm Lauren. And I'm Lena. And this is Pass, Pass Me the Booze. Booze, a paranormal podcast where we discuss the history and hauntings of local and not so local places while partaking in adult booverages. In each episode, we share a different haunted place and pair it with a drink. This week, Penhurst! What's our drink for this week? So our drink this week is called the Mayflower Martini, inspired by the name of the main building on uh, Penhurst's campus, the Mayflower Building. Ooh. So our drink is uh, a martini. So you take a sweet vermouth and you kind of like coat your glass in it. S- swirl it around a bit. Yeah, and then you pour the excess like, I guess, back in the bottle. What? <laughs> oh, yeah, you uh, save it. That's alcohol abuse if it goes down the drain. I mean, yeah, just, just like vermouth backwash. Vermouth backwash. Um, and then you take one part gin, two parts white cranberry juice. Nice. Shaken with ice. Not um, stirred. Not stirred. Shaken, not stirred. And it is supposed to be garnished with fresh cranberries. And uh, we learned today, it's the middle of June, it's the beginning of June, and we learned that um, cranberries are not a summer fruit. Nope. (laughs) I was today years old when I learned that the people at the local grocery store did not think I was a bright individual when I asked if they had fresh cranberries right now. Oops. The more you know. The more you know. So yeah, enjoy that uh, adult beverage as we dive into our history of Pephurst. Buckle up. All right, so to look at the history of Pennhurst. So in January of 1903, the Pennsylvania legislatures authorized the establishment of the Eastern State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. Yikes. Yeah, uh, which is the second of state or second such state operated facility of its kind. Oh, which was fun fact. Number two. It's number two. Deuce. Um, in May of that same year, the construction began at a site locally known as Crab Hill, in the borough of Spring City, and the construction included the main building, which is the Mayflower Building, and some of the dorms. In November. Of 1908, on the 23rd, um, only listed as patient number one, arrived at Penhurst. After him, over 10,000 residents followed, as this was one of the only options for parents who had disabled children and needed help. Oh, God. Yeah. Not great. Not, not, not a good start. They're just like, oh, this is where I can just dump my child. Yeah. Great, take them. Ugh. So, four years later, yes. in 1912... Overcrowded and underfunded, Penhurst comes under fire for lumping the feeble-minded, and I am using air quotes there because I hate that term. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. And epileptics in the same group. And this sparked the mission statement change, which meant only those with intellectual disabilities were admitted in. So they kind of um, said fuck you to the epileptics. (laughs) I don't know. Have we decided we're cussing on this? (laughs) Oh, Yeah. Sorry, don't let your kids listen to this. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I cuss a, a lot. lot. <laughs> um, in 1913, the PA legislature appoints the Commission for the Care of the Feeble-Minded. And this group stated residents of Penhurst were unfit for civil citizenship and that they were a menace to the peace. That's rude. Fuck Very. this guy. Who's this guy? Uh, so this was the group called the Commission for the Care of Feeble-Minded. Mm. And so what's important to note here is that the language they used, uh, that, you know, people who were at Penhurst were unfit for citizenship, and they posed a, uh, which I'm gonna call it to the peace, a minute, they were a menace to the peace. It's echoing language that was used in Dred Scott v. Stanford. Mm which argued that African Americans should not be a part of white society due to being unfit and inferior. So they're using the same shit that they used in, like, civil rights cases. Yeah, they're like, oh, I guess we can't use that kind of language anymore for this group, so we're gonna just take it over to this group. Unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. I don't like that. That's awful. Yeah. So in 1916... A female campus was proposed in, for Penhurst in order to separate the boys and the girls. So up until this point, 
they had had people trying to, like, drop their daughters off. Right. But they were like, nope, can't. There's only boys here. Uh. So, uh, to kind of accommodate that, they proposed a new part of campus and dorms be added so that they could have females and males. All right. And while the school initially was only funded for 1200 uh, they had bumped that up to 2400 due to the change. Oh, my. Double so, yeah. So, in 1918, there was this guy, Dr. Henry Goddard, and he was the chief physician of Penhurst and a leading eugenicist in America. That, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah, I don't know about that. Not a great pair. Um, and he said that every feeble-minded person is a potential criminal. And while the eugenic like, movement was very short-lived in America after the Nazis, thankfully, mm. Mm. It, it found, like, solid footing in Penhurst and validated yeah. the poor treatment of the residents and kind of, like, was what they, like, leaned on mm -hmm. for saying, no, it's fine, we're tying children to bed. Right. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, they they have all these practices that they, I guess, stole from the Nazis. Is that what I'm... It's it's more like the beliefs that they right. stole from the Nazis, like, as to why they could treat human beings as not human beings. Yeah, they, I guess they figured, oh, well, these parents are just dropping these people off, like, no one cares about them, so no one's gonna care what we do to them. Well, and it's, it's, people who are on the spectrum have, like, been treated kind of shittily for mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. Um, and somewhere, like... It went, the idea went from, like, taking care of these people to them being a burden on society. Yeah. And I think that historical switch is, like, real fascinating. And, like, it, you can trace it back to different cultures and different societies all throughout history, making that change at some point mm -hmm. where people were like, oh, we're taking care of them. They're becoming a strain on our resources. They must be witches. Like, and, like, just a historical reference. <laughs> and at this point, in, in, like, the 1900s, or late 1900s, I guess it was, these people are draining our resources, let's lock them up and kind of treat them without any respect or compassion. Horrid. Horrid. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we improved a little. We're not burning them at the stake. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Baby steps, I guess, but I think oh. we need to take strides. <laughs> oh, we do. We really do. Long legs. Long legs. Jump. <laughs> Alright, so and then in 1955, Penhurst had 3,500 residents at once. Um, so because of this, there were two annexes that were former tuberculosis sanitariums. They're purchased by Penhurst and opened for overflow housing. So it, like... It means that at the 4,100 individuals that resided at Penhurst properties were spread out. So it wasn't all in Spring City. Mm -hmm. I think the one annex was, like, closer to Pittsburgh, and the other one was up north somewhere. Okay, so it had, like, sub-schools, I guess. Yeah, but in 1961, those two campuses kind of, like, said peace and left Penhurst. They didn't want to be associated Ooh. anymore. <laughs> Uh, we see what you're doing here. We don't like it. We're out. Yeah. Goodbye. Um, so then in 1968, conditions at Penhurst are exposed in a five-part television news report by CBS's Bill Baldini. Bill Baldini. We, we love Bill we, Baldini. We stand yes. Bill Baldini. We stand yeah. Bill Baldini. <laughs> uh, and it showed the public the failings of Penhurst and exposed a lot of the abuses that the children and individuals there who were not being adequately cared for due to low funding. We need Bill Baldini at the border ASAP. Yeah, uh, we have children in cages in the, this modern day and age. Yeah, we do. Mr. Baldini, we need your help. Yeah, where are you? Pull out the Baldini signal. Someone, please, put it in the sky. Help. So, in 1971, Park which I'm not sure what the acronym is for, it's just P-A-R-C, mm. the Commonwealth of PA, solidified the segregation of disabled students from neurotypical ones, causing more school-aged individuals to be committed to institutions like Penhurst. 
So it pretty much just opened the door to if you have a child on the spectrum, you don't have to take care of your kid anymore. You can dump them off at a state-funded facility where they will be horribly abused, but they will not be your responsibility anymore. Wow. That is just terrible. Like, just kind of thinking of all of my friends, like, today that are on the spectrum or have disabilities like epilepsy, thinking that they could just be randomly dropped off at this horrible, horrible place and, like, never seen again. Yeah. Well, and, like, I think it is important to note before our next little uh, blip in the timeline is that some parents really did believe that Penhurst was going to be beneficial and helpful to the development of their kid. They just had no idea. They had no idea. And even, like, after the Bill Baldini stuff, like, think of it this way. Penn State. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) We are. Penn State. But Penn State had all of those horrible Title IX accusations thrown out there recently. Mm -hmm. And their uh, retention rate for students and their tuition numbers have kind of remained the same. And sometimes, in some of the years past then, it's even, like, gone up. Interesting. So it's, like, that's that was, like, a, a news story. Like, you heard about it all the time. But people didn't really... I don't know if it's, like, they didn't care or it didn't register as, like, Right, like, this, news. Could, this couldn't happen kind of thing, Yeah, I guess. And it, it's, I think, in a lot of situations, yeah, the term fake news is relatively recent in our history, but I think that the idea behind it has been there for years. Oh, absolutely. Like, people do not trust the media. And there are some parents who probably watched Bill and were like, fake. That's a set in Hollywood. Yeah, because I'm sure, like, if they dropped their kid off thinking that they would get help, and then they see something like that on the news, that they don't want to be like, oh no, I dropped my kid off there. I am responsible for this in some way. Like, not that they are responsible for that, but then they would have to face that, like, guilt. Yeah, 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 exactly. Which is kind of what leads us to our next point, that in 1974, Halderman v. Penhurst was filed. Mm -hmm. The first case brought against Penhurst by the mother of a child. The case eventually reached the United States Supreme Court, and organizations moved to intervene in this case to protect Penhurst Mm. from being found responsible for the wrongdoing. However, in 1977, despite the intervening, Halderman v. Penhurst was tried. The district court determined that Penhurst provided such a dangerous, miserable environment for its residents that many of them actually suffered physical deterioration and intellectual regression during their stay at the institution, And in 1984, the final settlement was arranged uh, for the closure of Penhurst. Hooray! So, in 1986, Penhurst permanently closed its doors. And, unfortunately, while it was great they closed, unfortunately, they did so in the worst way possible by kind of just kicking everybody out. (gasps) And, you know, as people who are relatively local to the area, Mm -hmm. we can attest for the fact that there are quite a few homeless people who we know to be previous Penhurst residents. Yeah, these people are still alive and walking around. Yeah. So, from 1986 to 2007, uh, many different parties fought over the land Penhurst is on and fought over, like, who has legal rights to Penhurst. And in 2008, Penhurst was sold and added to the National Register of Historic Places, Mm. which is great because we definitely should preserve this history and Uh, learn from it and grow. Absolutely, because it seems like we still have not learned our lesson years later. No, we have not. (laughs) Um, In 2010, Mm. because we all suck as a society... Penhurst Haunted Asylum opened its doors and began to spread the myth that the buildings were used as an insane asylum. Oh no! Which sparked many (laughs) different things. Um, What was it? It was the inspiration, like Penhurst became the inspiration for um, Asylum. Yes, like in American a, Haunting Asylum. Yes, 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 yes. American yes. Horror Story. Yeah, there it is. So, Penhurst was open for many years. 
many horrible things happened there. So there are some cool things that people say they've experienced since then walking through Penhurst. Oh yes, yeah, spooky um, stories. Spooky stories. So one of them is the king, who was supposedly a like handyman in the 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. So he, it like, they call him the king because when they use spirit boxes or ghost boxes uh, to communicate with the spirits at Penhurst, when they're in the boiler room of the Mayflower building, uh, there's a male voice that consistently calls himself king. Oh boy, looking, get a little of this guy. Yeah. Uh, so the king likes the ladies. Mm. He is more likely to talk and, you know, <laughs> do stuff Chat when a lady is What's present. Uh, and people have been known to successfully lure him out and talk to him over spirit boxes by providing cigarettes and cigars. Yeah. And when people say that, like, they're in the boiler room, even if none of those are lit, they say that sometimes they can smell smoke. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, also, in the boiler room with the king is... Oof. oof. We're calling her Oof. oof. U-F-V. Miss Oof. Miss Oof. Uh, an unidentified female voice who tries to warn people away from the king. Oof. Who has also been known to be slightly hostile if he doesn't like you. I mean, he gave himself the name the king. Yeah. So I <laughs> yeah, that's a, think he's that's got a, a little bit of an ego on him. A little warning sign. Um, <laughs> also, one of the more prevalent and consistent stories is the music box. Oh. Um people have said that they have heard music coming from an unidentifiable source. I hate a disembodied music box. Yeah. And it's not like just like music, it's old timey music, so it's no. worse. No. It's so much worse. <laughs> and uh, it's been said that the music tries to lure people into unsafe parts of the building. Uh, because these buildings, like you have to imagine nobody took care of them. Yeah, the, for years. Yeah, it's been abandoned. I mean, before the attraction for like twenty five years, just yeah. sitting there rotting. And so because everyone was arguing about who had like access and owned the property, nobody took care of that shit though. <laughs> nope. They all just let it deteriorate and fall apart. So the buildings are a lot of them are structurally unsound. Mm -hmm. Like from experience, when you're walking around. It's not abnormal for, like, bricks to fall around you and shit. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so this music box lures people into unsafe parts of the building. And there is no music box to be found, though, in the Mayflower building. So they just, like, follow this music, it gets louder and louder, and then when they think that they find the room that this music box is in, it's just not there. It's poofed. Poof. Nothing. That is spooky. I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that either. You know, when I hear random music, like, in a building that's supposed to be abandoned, I'm not gonna follow it. <laughs> See, I wish that people whose, like, stories that we have and, like, stories that we have looked up at for this, I wish they were like that. Because, to me, it's <laughs> like, they're like the people in the, like, horror movies who are like, I'll be right back, and mm -hmm. then... They're dead, because that's what you say right before you get killed. Yes, we know how this formula works. Yeah. It's just, you don't follow the music. <laughs> Turn tail, run, get out. Yes. Lena, do you know what I love? A shot of Annie Get Your Gun with a chaser of ginger ale? I mean, yeah. But I also love not leaving my house. Dude, same. I love my bed and my blankets, and they have accepted me as one of their own, and if I leave now, they will never trust me again. Don't compromise that relationship. I can't. But especially right now. Yes, especially during a pandemic. Don't leave your house. And the last thing I want to do is go out to the grocery store when I could just have everything I need delivered to my house. Is that why you Instacart? That is exactly why I Instacart. They can deliver fresh groceries straight to my door, sometimes in as little as one hour. Or I can schedule the delivery if I'm not going to be around. Instacart now also has multiple options based on your needs from pet stores, 
to your local pharmacy, and our personal favorite, even alcohol. Hell yeah. And they even have a section for people who use food stamps, so you can find exactly what you need all in one place. So follow the link in our show notes to go to instacart.com to get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Instacart. Never take a step in a grocery store ever the f*** again. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Lena. How do we do this? Do what? Make our podcast. Oh, we use Buzzsprout. Do you want to know one of the best things about it? What? You can start a show for free. That's my favorite four-letter F word. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Buzzsprout wants their podcasters to succeed. So in addition to distributing your podcast for you, you'll get a great looking podcast website, detailed analytics, promotional tools, and they'll even help you pick out the right equipment for you. And that's just scratching the surface. So follow the link in our show notes to let Buzzsprout know we sent you and get a great deal on every subscription level. If you sign up for a paid plan, this also gets you a $20 Amazon gift card that you could put towards, I don't know, a new microphone for your podcast. Oh, that's a low blow. (laughs) And of course, this helps support our show. So follow the link in our show notes to go to buzzsprout.com and join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. All right, so now we're going to get into some spoopy stuff. Ooh. All right, so the general happenings that people often report in this place are your typical stuff. Apparitions, shadows, uh, footsteps when no one's around, strange lights, cold spots, slamming doors, disembodied voices, fresh batteries will be drained from electronics, and my favorite, sounds of vomiting. That's not my favorite. (laughs) I couldn't even imagine. Like, if I just heard someone throwing up, I would just leave right away and go throw up somewhere else. I I would probably just start retching as well. My empathetic reaction. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, That's gotta be awful, just in the afterlife, vomiting on repeat. I am so sorry. Oh, man. All right. Um, But the basement seems to be where the most action happens. Um, This is where the infamous tunnels are in Penhurst. Yes. Yes. They run about... uh, 1,200 feet connecting to all the buildings. There are even rumors from locals that some of the tunnels run underneath the whole city of Spring City. I'm not sure how true that is, um, but I have heard stories where like some of the older buildings in Spring City, uh, in the basement, there are just these random openings and you can go walk into them and they're just these random tunnels that go on for God knows how long. Well, it's, it's, you know, again, being Kind of locals. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give anybody, like, our home address here, but, like, No, I'm not lo- trying to triangulate yeah. our location. Yeah, we're but. local. <laughs> and growing up, we did hear stories from, like, people who lived in the area who, like, were like, yeah, we've got tunnels in our basement that we're not allowed to go through because mom and dad said so. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone can confirm this, like, please email us. We yeah. would love to hear stories about these random-ass tunnels in your basements. Because I, I totally <laughs> believe, like, Penhurst at one point had, what was it, like, 1,400 acres? Yeah. Yeah. I totally it's, believe that there were tunnels under all 1,400 acres. Yeah, it was its own community. Yeah. I think it even had its own train stop at one point. Mm-hmm. I would have to look into that a little bit more, but, like, literally to just drop off supplies. I believe it. But anywho. Anywho. Um, apparently nowadays you can only get down to the tunnels when you do tours. Uh, unlike back in the day when people just used to go there all the time before they turned it into an attraction. This, like, as we said, I'm sure, this was a hot spot for urban exploration, but now I have to imagine um, they have a few spots sealed up pretty tightly. Safety and whatever. Uh, Interestingly enough, um, now a lot of the actors uh, were were those urban explorers, and that's why a lot of people say that this is one of the best attractions, because they know the ins and outs of the place, Mm -hmm. and basically grew up with the stories and being here all the time. 
That is to say, don't try to break into this place. They've been trying to restore a lot of the buildings, but some are just not structurally sound, mm. and they patrol it pretty heavily now. So Yeah, it's it's highly recommended that if you want to visit Penhurst, you do so officially. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's like tons of tours that you can do. You can do the haunted attraction. Um, they have a museum. Yeah. Like, visit Penhurst respectfully. Because <laughs> you will get caught and you will die. No, just kidding. Well, you'll definitely be fined. Um, and money is valuable, people. <laughs> so, I have a few stories here from the locals, uh, which, by the way, thank you to everyone that answered my Facebook yeah. post when I was <laughs> scourging for stories on the internet. Um, it, was, oh. it was, like, surprisingly difficult to find people's, like, yeah. first-hand accounts at Penhurst. I mean, the internet is just so saturated with all of the attraction stuff now that it's just hard to just find, find the actual spooky stuff there. Yes. Yeah. Unless you watch a Ghost Adventures episode from, like, 2007. I don't know. But yeah, this, uh, a lot of these stories were before it became an attraction in 2010. Um, and from what I've read, the Mayflower building seems to be the most active building. And that's why we have some Mayflower drinks today. Yes. Alright. So again, um, the most common sightings are lights and apparitions. Uh, sometimes people will see an apparition in a white dress. Um, I'm thinking maybe, like, it could be a gown from a patient, maybe even a nurse. Maybe, Makes sense. Maybe our mystery UFV, Miss Oof. Miss Oof, please stand up. <laughs> um, flashlight batteries die, even phone lights turn themselves off. Someone reported that after they saw some kind of red light in the tunnels, uh, there was the smell of cigar smoke, which I think might be our Mr. The King. Yes, lighten up. <laughs> in the tunnels uh, is supposedly where a lot of the children were kept uh, and where they did a lot of de dental work, um, or as some report. Uh, weird combo. It's a super weird combo. Like, this is where we keep children in cages. And teeth. <laughs> By the way, do you need a root canal? Um, one person actually stated that during a mini hunt in one of the tunnels, uh, they experienced a cold spot and an EMF reading um, about the size of a child. And they said, quote, I offered my hand and we walked that cold spot from one end of the tunnel to another. Aww. Which is so sad. <laughs> it's like, like sweet sad though. It's just like, oh my goodness, this nice stranger is walking me through this tunnel. Yeah. Oh god. Aww. So, oh, go no, it's just, it's like, when you think about it, it's just, all of these things make it so much worse that it was like kids. Yeah. They're, they're these little ghost children just yeah. trapped in this shitty building. Yeah. But someone, uh, actually found a dentist chair in a room in one of the tunnels, and... Please tell me they sat on it. It's just weird that it's still there. God, ugh, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Would you do that? I think I would. Oh. Like, I think it would just be, like, just to, like, get a reaction from something in the room with me, I would totally sit in the chair. Oh, my goodness. Ugh, you know? ugh. I feel like that's bad juju. I don't know. I mean, I'd, feel so I'd, like, take a bath in holy water after. Oh, yeah, Because, 100%. like, as, um... Someone who works at Penhurst says, mm -hmm. um, you know, she announces herself and that she has no, like, malicious intentions when she comes onto the property and into some of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And then when she leaves, she, like, out loud will say, you need to stay here. <laughs> Do not follow me. This is your home. Leave this me is, alone. Yeah, this is it. I'm leaving. You I'll see home. you tomorrow. I have my home. <laughs> Gotta set boundaries with these folks. Yeah. Especially because they're kids. Oh, man. But yes, uh, they found uh, that weird dentist chair in one of the rooms. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus. <laughs> and uh, when they were in this room, their phone light kept turning off. <clears throat> Ooh. Hold on. I need to uh, see the need to on, this new yeah. flower. The on and off of the light, though. Do you, I think that that's safe to say that it's not one of the epileptic ghosts. No, I don't think they would try to mess with that <laughs> stuff. Just like, 
<laughs> it's just like, they don't want seizures. This is bad news, Bears. I'm not going to touch this one. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got it. <clears throat> oh, man. Um, uh, this person also said that at one point uh, they could see someone in the window of our Mayflower building. And so they walked up to this room where they saw the figure. And they said that a chair moved from one side of the room to the other with no one there. It's the worst. I hate those kind. <laughs> yeah. Especially, like, if it moved fast. Hmm. Like, if it was, like, someone throwing a chair aggressively across the room. Um, yes. I don't like that. But I also don't like if, like, it's a slow pull. It's all bad. <laughs> like, no, I feel like if, like, there was a healthy medium of someone just walking a chair to the other side of the room <laughs> for a better seat... That would be okay. <laughs> but, like, someone aggressively throwing the chair or just slowly dragging it would just be awful. A friend that sent me that story, can you tell me the miles per hour that this chair was yeah. moving? We need speed. <laughs> <laughs> this one's weird. Someone said that they had to read a 1942 hymnal to stop an eerie noise that was gradually growing louder and closer. I don't like that. I don't like that either. Like, just because it's like, you had to read a hymnal. Yes, how did you know that it had to be this specific 1942 hymnal? I feel like that's very specific. Yeah. Like, Bible verse, get it. And, like, I would have been personally probably, like, doing the, like, Lord's Prayer, a couple Hail Marys, you know. (laughs) Throw in, like, the act of contrition in there, too, you know. Just to be safe. You're prepared for this. I have absolutely no idea. (laughs) Friend, send me some 42 hymnals. I need to be prepared for this shit. But uh, before it was an attraction, uh, a couple people were down in the tunnels and they said, quote, "Uh, We kept hearing something moving around and we could feel the wind move. We put our lights on and there was nothing but us. These tunnels, man. Yeah, well, and that, like, lines up with... um, Ripley's Believe It or Not, like, dot com, <laughs> did a tour of Penhurst in 2019. And when you read their article, they talk about, like, ghosts either walking past you or you walking mm-hmm. through one and it feeling like either, like, a gust of wind <laughs> or, like, you've breeze. walked through a spider web but can't find the spider web. That's the worst. I hate, I hate that. the spider web. I know. <laughs> like, that, that description literally, like, had me going, like, rubbing my arms off to make sure I didn't have a spider web on me. <laughs> Hated it. But, like, it, it lines up with things that people are even saying as recently as 2019. Yeah. Yes. These have been going on for such a long time. Um, but these, these these next few stories, I think they're all before it was an attraction and girl, all right, it's about to get intense. Love it. Let's go. Okay, so um, this story actually comes from a local witch. Ooh. Yes, very cool. We love a local witch. Yes. Um, so I'm just gonna read word for word what they sent me because they put it so well. So a set of years ago, before the whole theme park, uh, Penhurst, and before the whole theme park, Penhurst started, um, and it was still the creeptastic, unkempt mess, a friend and I decided to visit at night. I loaded up every spell and charm. I'm sorry, I can't word today. (laughs) I loaded up every spell and charm I could put on myself from silver to salt in the pockets uh, to iron nails. I was not fucking around. Period. Uh, I wouldn't either. <laughs> <laughs> I even warded my phone and drew extra marks, etc., on my arms, legs, torso, etc. Uh, my friend took a more scientific approach. She brought EMF detectors and night vision goggles, uh, lots of battery powered things. So we walked onto the grounds and had no issue, didn't have to sneak or anything really. Uh, mind it was nighttime. So she pulls out her night vision goggles and her EMF detector and starts going to town. Uh, we kept checking things, uh, the, de- blah, blah, blah. the detector kept ticking, nothing might, nothing major, until we took our exit path. The goggles died, her phone died, and the EMF detector redlined and went out. And we said, go, and took off like a shot. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I-, I mean, I would too. Mood. Everything just started dying. <laughs> yeah. So they took off like a shot, except... I couldn't move. (gasps) I dropped to the ground on my knees and got super fucking cold. Like when you step into a walk-in freezer cold, not malicious or fevered, just cold. 
the marks on my hands and ankles started to burn, and that's when I warmed back up again and we walked out of the grounds, where I drove the iron nails I had into the ground and sprinkled salt on top of them. When I got back to the car and in the light, my silver rings, necklace, and bracelet were all tarnished. Okay. <laughs> that's a lot to unpack. <laughs> so... To echo that, uh-huh. the Ripley's Believe It or Not team yeah. described in their article similar thing when encountering the king in the boiler room, mm. where they felt like it was they were just frozen, like cold. Fro- yes. But also, like I want to, I want, I don't know that much about Wicca, um, just because, you know, historically. My faith in, in Wicca don't uh, mesh well. <laughs> I was going to say, you're the exact opposite as a, uh, a yeah. Catholic here. Yeah, the, the Roman Catholics <laughs> did not stand the witches, and I'm pretty sure witches did not stand the Roman Catholics. So I, I'm very ignorant when it comes to the Wiccan belief system mm-hmm. and like what uh, the nails and what the salt mean. But I like I would be really curious as to... like why the silver tarnished what the nails and salt did like we just keep it there yes I, or i uh I, i've dabbled a little bit um but i know salt is like purification it's supposed to like keep evil away and, and that makes sense because like with silver salt is used for cure like purifying wounds yeah. Or was used, not is, no one currently does that shit, but, like, before, <laughs> they did. Everything's related. <laughs> yes. But, no, I, I know that, like, just based off of, one, having been to Penhurst, mm-hmm. both at the attraction and also, like, before it was an attraction, there are so many, like, ritualistic symbols yeah. throughout the buildings. Yes. So, like, imagine all the kids that go there late at night, like, trying to do seances, using Ouija boards. Like, I'm sure it invites, like, some shit that wasn't there before. And Well, and and the one person I did talk to who, like, works at Penhurst, she Mm -hmm. said that, like, these kids, even nowadays, like, as recently as, like, 2020, (laughs) these kids are sneaking onto the property... And they are playing with Ouija boards. Oh, no. And they're, like, drawing symbols they don't necessarily understand the meaning of. Because, like, as someone who grew up in this area, and this area is very predominantly uh, Christian of some variety. Mm-hmm. It, it, you are some variety Christian. We're, we're closer to, like, the Pennsylvania Bible Belt than I think a lot of people realize. Oh, yeah. We're very close to uh, Pencil Tucky, as they call it. Yeah, Bucktown. <laughs> Yeehaw! Um, I don't think the kids who are doing this necessarily understand mm-hmm. both the ramifications of their actions with this, but also, mm-hmm. like, they do not get what they're doing. Like, they, they yes. do not know the symbols they're drawing as well as I would hope, like, people would know. Like, the, the, the lovely witch who sent us that. Yes. Like... Said witch seems to understand the meaning behind what they've, like, marked themselves with before going onto the property. Oh, yeah. And I'd be interested to, like, know what the markings were and why they, like, heated up. Oh, yeah. I, I trust them 100% with this kind of stuff. And yeah. And I'll ask them next time I, next time I talk to them. Because, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in, like what exactly those symbols were, what they were supposed to ward off, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah, that being said, children, youths, listen up. Um, Don't play with Ouija boards. Uh, Google is a wonderful thing. Learn about those symbols. Yeah. No, before you go. And if you do play with a Ouija board, always say goodbye. Always say goodbye. maybe have some holy water on you. Or salt. Yeah. Yeah. For your faith. (laughs) (laughs) The more you know, the more you know. Thanks, G.I. Joe. All right. <laughs> we need, a, like, a rainbow going above us. The more you know. <laughs> That's a very good visual for an audio platform. It's <laughs> <laughs> what's happening in my head. <laughs> um, so now we're circling back to these crawl spaces in the basement. Oh. These weird-ass tunnels that seem to go every which way. I hate them. 
The crawl spaces, though, I'm wondering what those were for. Because you have the regular tunnels that you walk through, and yes. then apparently these tiny little ones that... I don't know. Well, like, just based off of knowledge of, like, how you would, like, want to ventilate something like a tunnel, oh. I could imagine some of these, like, little, like, not rooms, but, like, little, like, bump-outs being, like, some sort of ventilation system. Okay. But at the same time, like, I, I personally, <laughs> even though I have explored Penhurst, uh, illegally, I, <laughs> just that, kidding, allegedly, <laughs> I've allegedly explored Penhurst illegally, um, I have allegedly never been in tunnels, mm -hmm. and, like, even when I went to the attraction, I did not go in the tunnels, just because... The tunnels were the one part that, like, I did get, like, bad juju vibes when I would, like, go, spooky. like, near the entrances. So I was, like, always, like, nope. Spooky. Spoopy. Nook. Mm, run away. Run away. Um, so I don't know what the bump, like, the little, like, bump outs look like. And I don't know if anybody who's ever explored them can say whether or not there's some sort of, like, ventilation happening with them. But that's one potential uh, reason that they're there. I mean, that makes sense to me. Like, my, my dumb brain automatically goes to something sinister. Like, oh, there's these spooky tunnels and now there's these crawl spaces. Who are they keeping in there? What are they doing? Oh, I definitely believe that, like, at some point those little, like, crawl spaces were used to cage children when they were caging children in the tunnels. Well, <laughs> but, like... I don't think that they initially built the tunnels with the, you know, mindset of, and these are going to be the tunnels that connect this building to this building, and you see every X amount of feet, there are these little, like, mm -hmm. bump outs that are not enough, like, to be a room, but they're big enough to put a child in a cage in. You know what we could fit in here? <laughs> like, two kids? <laughs> Bring them down. Bar them up. Let's go. I don't think that was ever the intention. No. Well, I would Until, like, not. the eugenicist. <laughs> then I think it was the intention. But when they were building the building, I never were like, I don't think they were ever like, yeah, we can cage kids here. <laughs> Woof. <laughs> but yeah, circling back, circling back. Um, the crawl spaces. Um, so apparently this one person uh, said, quote, I crawled through this tunnel for about 30 minutes with no end in sight. When I started getting touched, that was when I started crawling backwards. I just told myself, don't look back, don't say anything, just get out. Mm -mm. Nope. That's a big nope for me. God, I, I uh. hate small spaces to begin with and just crawling for 30 minutes just so I cannot turn around and things are touching me. Nope. No, thank you. I think at, like, some point, like, that individual has to be so strong because at some point I definitely would have been like, please stop. I would have peed my Touching pants. Touching me. Oh, be honest oh, with you right Pants would have been, like, peed. It would have been, like, me sobbing. But, <laughs> like, I would have at least gone out. Do not touch me. <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> like, I would not have been able to do that. You hot, baby girl? You can go downstairs. Okay. <laughs> the look. My dog is old, but she likes being around people, even when it's hot. Mm, Boopy. Um, so now this is a story from a former attraction worker. Um, this person was put in the tunnels, of course, mm -hmm. and their job was to basically jump out and scare people as they walk by, and, uh, their indication for approaching people was a shadow created by one of the spotlights, uh, they had down there. So they could see, like, a shadow of someone coming caused by the light, and then, like, oh, okay, that's my cue, and jump out. Um, okay. Well, apparently, <laughs> this person kept missing their cue because they would see the shadow, jump out, and no one would be there. <laughs> Dude. So sometimes this would cause the, caused them to jump out before their cue, and then they'd already be standing out in the open when actual people would come around. And uh, I think he, he said that he got in trouble for it. Because he kept missing his cue, and he's like, what, I see people, I jump out, I go boo, what do you want? Yeah, I mean, I feel like that not ne that's not necessarily the actor's fault. That's definitely, like, he needs a better cue. Like, you're in a haunted <laughs> building, 
and you're gonna be like, rely on the shadows. Oh god. They're I... they're great stage managers. They're gonna like really help you. You'll be perfectly on every time. <laughs> Mind you, the stage manager ghost is a child. Oh god. <laughs> I, I can't imagine trying to explain some of these things to your boss. Like, <laughs> it wasn't me, it was a spooky ghost. He's like, I saw the cue, I went on cue. I said boo. I said boo. And <laughs> nobody was there. Sorry, everybody. So, who gave me the cue? <laughs> it's a classic who done it. Yeah. Um, but, interesting fun fact. Uh, they actually used to do search and rescue training for teams and their dogs uh, in that 25-year period where it was just abandoned. Nice. Um, there, there is one story in particular from a local that really freaks me out. So, there was this one young guy uh, working with his partner in one of the buildings. He was set to be the, quote, target for the search uh, and rescue dogs um, on one floor. And then his partner was supposed to be working, like, a few, few floors above him. And, um, so this guy is just sitting there at the end of the hallway, uh, lined with hospital rooms, which all of the doors are open. Nope. Ooh, ooh, Mm -mm. ooh. Nope. Nope. (laughs) And then, uh, suddenly he hears something at the end of the hall. Mind you, it's near pitch black in this place. Uh, he thinks it's his partner, who is supposed to be several floors above him at this point, um, so he calls out to him. Nothing. And then he hears door slam at the end of the hallway. And then more doors. And then more doors. And more door. And then Frodo and Sam take the ring to more door. And, no. <laughs> um, he's realizing that the doors at the end of the hallway are simultaneously being slammed and working their way towards him. <laughs> no. And he sees this happening as they're getting closer, so he just immediately books it out of the building. Which, smart move. I mean, yeah. That's how you survive the horror movie. Woo! Uh, nope. I could not imagine. I could not either. Because mm. it's, it, that's something, like, that's just so, um, cinematic. It is. That it's, it's, it's something hard. out of a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard to, like, be like, no, this actually happened to a human being. Holy shit. Uh, now some of what is being done with the school, uh, now since it's been turned into an, an attraction, and I know people still feel a certain way about it, I certainly still feel some kind of way about it. Yeah. Um, I think everybody locally does. Like, everybody locally, like, has the feels of it. Yeah. Uh, Some of the language that's used on the website is a little icky. (laughs) A little. You know, (laughs) quote, unquote, feeble-minded. Yeah. Penhurst Asylum, home to the world's most dangerous, criminally insane. Yeah. Except (laughs) not really doesn't rub you the the right way. No, Um, not at all. But yeah. Uh, Here is what the owners have to say in regard to some of the reactions they've gotten over the years. Um, The attraction's goal is not to exploit the horrors that went on here, but to preserve the buildings and its history. Uh, They're taking the the publicity as an opportunity to bring awareness as to what actually went on here. With over 30,000 people coming through yearly, they have the opportunity to learn about Penhurst like never before instead of letting it rot away. Which is good in its own way, but yeah, like I said... I mean, definitely, like, preserve, reserve, you know. Yeah. Do the stuff, but, like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, some of it just feels a little insensitive to former patients who are still very much alive. <laughs> and, like, homeless. Yes. Walking the streets of Pottstown. Yeah, like, uh, I, I've told you before, uh, Josh, my fiancé, everybody, um, used to work at a facility, uh, that cared for the mentally and physically disabled yeah. as, like, a day program, and a lot of his patients were from Penhurst, former patients, and, you know, they still suffer from PTSD from what they experienced there. I mean, so yeah. Just, and... just keep that in mind if you feel like you maybe want to visit the attraction. I don't know. Do what you want. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I visited Penhurst when it first opened. And, like, 2010 was... What, it's 2000... It's 2021? Oh, that boy. was 11 years ago. What? I was... Not that it's, like, an excuse, but, like, I was a kid. I didn't know any better. 
Right. And I, I did believe that, you know, Penhurst was in the same asylum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the narrative they're putting out. I, I feel it's, it feels a little dangerous. It feels a little bit like monopoly, like, like, not, I don't know the word. Monopolizing. Monopolizing, monetizing. <laughs> yes. Trauma and a really horrible history in a very icky way. Yes. You know, I don't, I don't like it. It's a bit icky. It's a bit icky, but I'm glad that they are doing that and that they are, like, you know, restoring some of the buildings and, like, keeping it as Penhurst. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, putting it on the National Registry is one thing, but, like, I, I just hope that whatever they're doing isn't erasing the actual history of what happened there because, like, it's so vital that, like, that integral piece of, you know, children were, like, horrifically abused here due Mm -hmm. to an underfunded, overcrowded, uncompassionate group of people. Yeah. You know, the eugenics eugenics movement. (laughs) Um, Like... It was it was a thing that happened and it's our history and I don't think that it should be, you know, either washed over mm-hmm, or I don't mm-hmm. think it should be um, altered to mm-hmm. be something more fantastical than it was. Yes. So if you do want to go to this attra- at this attraction, I do encourage you to look into the history a little bit. Just it's, yeah. it's important. It's yeah. important. Learn stuff. Learn. Go stuff. to school. Support them, but like go in with knowing that. It was not an insane asylum. No. And, and, like, to keep in mind, so it's like they they were taking kids that were quote-unquote feeble-minded. Right. So, like, we call that, like, neuroatypical. Right. Um, it's that, like, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of it, that includes disabilities like ADHD. Oh, God. I'm, I'm there. Yeah. I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> like, kids who are... You know, high anxiety. <laughs> oh, I'm there. Same. <laughs> uh, kids with depression. Like it oh, was. No. <laughs> it was literally. It wasn't just like what you think of when you think of like um, mentally unwell or mentally. Right. Yes. It, it was literally a- anything. anything on that spectrum, and that spectrum is so wide. Yes. Yes. So, like, just thinking about the type of kids. Hmm. Any type, like from, you know, children with autism to people who were just really, really depressed. Yep. Like, all of those people were lumped together there. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't think any of them were insane. Nope. And there definitely wasn't, like, a criminal aspect, because the majority of them were kids. Yeah, from what, like, the research, like, from what you read, from what I've seen, like, I didn't find anything, like, like, criminal history? No one with criminal history? So, well, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think... Like, I'll, I would have to do more research on it, but, like, we're real close to Eastern State Penitentiary. Yes. Yes. And, like, I think that this was definitely solidly before people were like, oh, you committed a crime because you're not mentally well. Right. And that mentally unwell person who committed a crime probably was not sent to... An institution. No. Like, they were, Penhurst. They were sent to prison. They were sent to jail. And the jail system is a whole nother topic we'll talk about that's a, later. That's a whole <laughs> nother episode, friends. <laughs> but, like, I don't... I, I, I would struggle to believe that, like, anybody there actually had a criminal record. Yeah, I I don't I mean, think maybe so. the staff. <laughs> you know what? Very Some much of the doctors. The staff. <laughs> I want to take a look at their history. Yeah. Um, Mr. The King, I'm looking at you. Mr. The King. Um, but if you want to learn more uh, about this place yourself and its haunted history, um, the school has been featured on shows like Ghost Adventures, shout out to Zach Beggins, uh, (laughs) and Ghost Hunters. Uh, A&E, uh, did a special on it. Yeah, uh, this group investigated and spent, like, two weeks on the grounds in 2019, so you can probably find that somewhere. Yeah. Very recent. I have to watch that, too. Yeah. And, you know, BuzzFeed. Yes. (laughs) BuzzFeed did it, too. (laughs) (laughs) That was super cool. That was fun. Um, But since the attraction opened, uh, it's been named one of the most haunted attractions in the United States. 
Uh, they actually hosted Paracon back in 2019 um, that had a few celebrity investigators, such as Grant Wilson from Ghost Hunters, mm-hmm. uh, John Zaffis, a haunted collector. Nice. Dave Tango, uh, also from Ghost Hunters. Nice. Brian J. Kano uh, from Haunted Collector and Paranormal Caught on Camera. And then Steve Gonzalez uh, from Ghost Hunters. I love Steve. <laughs> um, they, of course, have a yearly Halloween haunt that they do. Uh, you can request to do different kinds of tours here. Um, I'm pretty sure they're year-round. There's the overnight investigations, which allow you to explore all four floors of the Mayflower Hall and give you access to the underground tunnels Um their names are Philadelphia, Devon, and Rockwell. And then the day tours, uh, where you just follow your tour guide around to all 16 buildings and learn about the history of the campus. I'm told that you can watch horror movies on the courtyard, but I couldn't find much on that. Um, yeah, I, I know, I, I didn't see it online, but like I know that the people who like do the haunted attraction also do like a camp during the summer. Oh, maybe that's it? Um, where, like, you can sleep for, like, a couple of nights and a couple of days, like, at Pinhurst and camp and, like, tents and stuff. Can we do that? I'd love to do that. I don't know if, like, COVID times have changed that, but, like, I know someone who did it and, like, was working it because they were an actor at Pinhurst and, like, that was, like, their summer job. (sighs) Yeah, I want to do that, so I'd love to do that. (laughs) But yeah, um, what I found really cool is that for, for like the day tour, you can go to all 16 buildings. Guys, this campus is friggin' huge. Yeah, like 1,400 acres huge. Friggin' huge. And like those tours where it's like an actual tour, mm-hmm. I would highly recommend because it yeah. is going to be more of the historical, like factual stuff and not so much the, you know, cheap boo. Boo type scares like mm-hmm. Penhurst is scary enough we don't need fake blood yeah. and ghosts like ghost costumes because there are ghosts um <laughs> no but yeah like uh learning about the history is really cool and I think during the tour I'm pretty sure they bring like EMF detectors and whatever because I they know that you want to search for yeah. ghosts and shit and I'm, I'm pretty sure the tourists, or the, uh, no, not the tourists, the opposite of the tourists, the host. The guide. Tour guide, the tour guide. Pretty sure some of the tour guides are former nurses, so, like, you're gonna get That's some cool. really cool inside shit. Yeah, so, like, bring your divining rods and go do that. <laughs> exactly. Um, but as you said, this school, uh, inspired many quote, asylum-themed movies, like uh, American Horror Story, and uh, most recently, um, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Yes! That was was an interesting surprise for me when I first saw that movie. I didn't know that that was inspired by this. (laughs) Yes! Um, And there's even a documentary on it titled, uh, just titled Penhurst on Amazon Prime, that tells the story of the hospital and interviews a few former employees. And um, you can find out more about what locals are doing to preserve the site and the work they're doing to better the livelihoods of those with disabilities by going to preservepenhurst.org. Their vision is to, quote, be part of an effort to create a world-class museum to honor the memorial and memorialize the ongoing civil and human rights struggle of Americans with disabilities at a location of national significance to ensure we never go back. And yes. that's Penhurst. That is Penhurst. Spooky stuff. Spooky, Spooky stuff. stuff. Thank you everyone so much for listening. Be sure to follow us on our socials at Pass Me the Booze, spelled B O O S. We're going to try and post regularly with previews to upcoming episodes, as well as our drinks of the week. If you partake in the drink of the week while listening to our episodes, please tag us. We'd love to see it. We also want to start reading some of your stories at the end of each episode. So if you have a scary story that you'd like to share, you can send that to passmethebooze at gmail.com with the subject title bonus booze. Again, that's B-O-O-S. These can be anything from personal ghost stories, UFO or cryptid sightings, uh, even true crime. We, we want to hear it all. 
Uh, we also welcome drink suggestions, so if you're a bartender, hit us up. Or just a boozy aficionado. Yes. Uh, lastly, please consider giving us a nice rating wherever you might get your podcasts. It really helps us out in the rankings and will allow us to keep making the show and making it even better. And tell your friends, tell your families, tell your dog. We have some really big plans for the podcast, and we would love to be able to make that happen for you all. And I think that's everything. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye.